All right, we're back again. Another edition of the Manifestor Mindset. Um, and I'm really excited for this particular edition because today we're going to talk how do we get ourselves out of this uh, pandemic. And uh, I spent a lot of time probably like many people out there looking at different potential solutions, feeling sometimes powerless, uh, feeling like you got to take your matters into your own hands. And um, I spent a significant amount of time looking at potential interventions and trying to do the best I can to be an amateur you know, detective and scientist. And where I landed on is a, a company that I've become so passionate about and a technology that I've becoming, I became so passionate about that I decided to invest, support. I've been spending an ungodly amount of time because they're good people trying to make a significant contribution that could really change the way we live, the way we relate, uh, and help us hopefully get out of the pandemic. So I don't want to take up too much time because Fred Masick is the chief technology officer, chief scientist, and the founder of a company called Healthy Technologies. Today, we're going to unpack a couple of things. I'm going to have Fred explain his background uh, and understand how he figured out uh, all this mad science and uh, under help explain the difference between far UVC light, which is what we're talking about, and the UV light that your mother told you to be very afraid of and put sunscreen on. So we're going to talk about the difference. And we're going to talk about if this is so great, why isn't it everywhere? So I want to get all of some of the skeptical questions out there too. Hit us with your questions and line them up right here. I can see them off to the right. I'm Heather, a harder on my team is going to pick them up. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to you, Fred. Welcome. Well, thanks, Matt. Thank you. And then thanks for everything. Um, you know, we we started this uh, this this venture, this, this, this adventure uh, mm -hmm. uh, about 13 years ago. And we started looking at how we could utilize light uh, to sanitize uh, different spaces. In particular, the space we were interested in was the International Space Station at the time. And we looked at lo using different types of, of UV light uh, and seeing how we can clean things like plumbing and space and air. And, and th that became sort of a focus of research for a number of years. Um, and then a number of years back, seven, eight years back, we started introducing this idea to, to potential customers out there in the, in the retail space, in the travel industry, uh, in transit. And we got very much um, uh, ho-hum responses, but, but they said everything was interesting, but the technology wasn't really what they needed today. It wasn't something they thought they were going to experience. They didn't have any idea that a, a pandemic might be coming. Um, and so they, they took an interest, but uh, were very politely telling us to, to, to go elsewhere. We continued that research uh, and continued to develop product, uh, focusing mostly on, on air and somewhat on surfaces as well. And this product became the offering that we have today. And the offering that we have today is, is an evolution of that. Um, we have a product that is far. Well, let me cut you off. I'm going to try to unpack you, okay? Because I know okay. that brain is finally firing at whatever the RPMs are for brain you know, neurons. But let's first let's explain to people the the science between, behind far UVC 222 nanometers and the difference between everything else. Okay, so for decades, uh, eight, eight or nine decades now, we've had UVC lighting. Uh, UVC lighting has been known to be uh, able of deactivating or inactivating uh, pathogens, uh, viruses, bacteria, by essentially uh, deactivating and distorting the bonds that hold them together, thymine bonds within their DNA, RNA structures. Um, what's new today is, is we have this, this new type of UVC. It's called far UVC. It's 222 nanometers, as you said. And this 222 nanometers is, is equally devastating to the pathogens in cases, maybe even a bit more in some cases, um, but has some very, very novel other factors associated with it. And one of those factors is it does not disturb the human body. It does not penetrate the body. It does not penetrate our skin. It does not penetrate our eyes. And there has been marvelous research done uh, a lot by Dr. Brenner over at Columbia University for the past decade and, and others around the world that have noticed that this is a very good antiviral, antipathogen uh, type of light frequency, but it doesn't disturb the human body. It, it, it is non-mutagenic to us. Right. So those. So those. So you're you're toiling away in Florida, working on light, space station, other interventions, circadian rhythm, things you could do with the power of light, which you've dedicated your life to, including 222. Dr. Brenner is toiling away at Columbia, gives a TED talk in 2017 after a friend of his had passed away from a superbug, saying a pandemic is coming, a pandemic is coming. No one's quite paying attention. Uh, and then and then this happens, right? So, so bring us up to speed about the potential applications for 222 and where, where it makes most sense to put it. So the confluence of events, as well as the way this particular pathogen we're looking at today, this, this COVID pathogen is, is spreading and, and the way it does spread and the way it is in aerosolized and we're worried about what's happening in the air, leads us to the point where we have to figure out ways we could treat the air and treat the surface in a space we intend to occupy 
in real time. And, and, and that's really what the, the high point is of uh, this type of technology. This, this is really where we're, we're pushing it because we can occupy a space and at the same time utilize 222 nanometer light to clean it for us. We can clean our surfaces, we can clean our air, we, we can reduce that pathogen load in the space as we use it and sort of approach what new normal is going to be. Right, so how long does it take to basically clean air, clean surfaces? I know that's a product of distance and light, but to the extent to which you could simplify, how long does it take? It, it's, it's, a, it's a product of distance, uh, light, and time. Um, and and you, if you toggle any of those three, you could reduce it or increase it. Um, but it's, it's between seconds in the very near field to, to some minutes in a, in a more distant field. So within a space, the, the air we're most concerned about, which is the air that, that rises, um, those can be deactivated significantly in, in some seconds, but the and the surfaces within that space in some minutes. Right. So let's talk about the uses that people are particularly nervous about, like a, like a subway. How could it be helpful on a subway? We're in New York City, right? I mean, when I'm talking to my team and talking to people, I'd say that's one of the biggest concerns people have is how do I get back on the subway? I don't want to be in confined space. I don't want to be in elevators. You just make it a little bit less abstract. Like, what, is there a billboard now? You know, Dr. Oz, then the next one is UV light, far UVC. No, I, I think what happens within those type of confined spaces, we know how these pathogens spread. We know we could simply, I mean, here's an example. Um, th this is a, a, a light uh, and an emitter, a 222 nanometer plasma emitter. Uh, it plugs directly into a socket like a light bulb would. These can go in and retrofit into lighting fixtures or be custom made to fit a subway car or an elevator car um, and be utilized simply to bring 222 in that environment and, and clean that air and clean that space in real time. So that if we have to enter a car, if we have to enter a subway car or an elevator car, we know it's being cleaned in real time and it's reducing that pathogen load within that space simultaneously to using it. So it's hitting the surfaces. It's hitting the. It's hitting. It's hitting the air. And now more people come in and out. Obviously, new viral load comes in, and it's doing the same thing, you know, over and over again. Right. And that's why it's so important, right? So the the, the other technologies that are out there today tell us go treat everything once, go wipe everything down very well, go uh, turn on a, a blaster and clean it. But then as soon as we start utilizing that space again, that space gets dirty. What What's so great about 222 nanometers is it, it allows us to take the same technology use it in, in a human friendly way, way so that we can inhabit an environment in real time and have it constantly being cleaned. Right, so so Fred, so anybody watching this, right, one of the hard hard things to overcome for you, I imagine, is you know, the, we've been around for four and a half billion years, at least the sun has been, right? And this spectrum was always available. We're talking only a span of 10, 10 years. I think people have a hard time fathoming if this really could be the holy grail, why hasn't been adopted before? Why hasn't it been adopted right this second? Like. Paint a picture about what you're what you're dealing with. I know you're on the front lines, running all over. You just got back from New York. Now you're back in Florida. You'll be flying somewhere tomorrow. Just give us a sense, because that I think is the number one skepticism. If it's so great, why why aren't we doing it? Well, it, it's a reasonably new technology. It's been around for a little over a decade and a half, uh, and it's really been thoroughly studied over this last decade. And as all technologies go, you how we utilize it, it, it takes a while to want to deploy it. it. It's it's a more expensive technology to deploy, to be frank, right now, because it's just not used yet in any kind of significant volumes. And we have this, we were trained. My, my mother and my grandmother trained me. UV, I'll put on sunscreen. Be careful with yourself. Um, it's a different kind of UV. It's a, it's a different kind of light. And, and we know that light has many, many effects on the human body and many, many effects on pathogens and many, many effects on plants. So it shouldn't be surprising that with time we discover some new portion of that light spectrum that gives us a, a new utilization. And that's exactly what this is. And so our challenge today is, is really an education one. It's telling people we have a solution that along with everything else, don't not wear your mask, don't, don't not wash your hands, but along with everything else we're trying to do will help limit this pathogen from becoming a contagion to us. And, and that's really what we're trying to, to accomplish here. Now there is a group of 240 uh, scientists, something to that effect, uh, who sent a letter to WHO uh, saying that you're, uh, you're de uh, underestimating the extent to which coronavirus is spread uh, through aerosol uh, droplets. And now I, I read today, I think actually, or yesterday, who has said they believe there is emerging research that is demonstrating. I think part of the problem for just a layperson like myself, we've been buffeted back and forth by the institutions we trust the most to tell us, you know, we don't have time to conduct our own studies, right? It spreads by services, it doesn't spread by services. But it does feel like science is now starting to settle that it can be on clothing, you can shed it to an extent, that it is spread through droplets, right? So help again crystallize if you were in a movie theater per se and you had far UVC light, does it, you know, you don't actually need to em uh, emanate light with 222, right? Just 
two 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 is, is completely invisible to the human eye. You you, you don't see it whatsoever. It's outside our, our visual acuity range, uh, and and it can be put into all sorts of gathering areas. It can be put into public bathrooms, transit systems, hospitals, um, schools, where, wherever we plan to want to use it. Uh, uh, elder care is, is another vector that we're very concerned with today. Uh, senior living, uh, any place where we can disrupt this type of pathogen from, from spreading on air and in surfaces, uh, we can utilize 222 to do that. Um, it, it, it's really a, a new tool in the toolbox and it's a very, very effective tool. And in my view, it's the best tool we have today. So what are the objections? So now you're out there, you're evangel evangelizing, you have the world's attention, finally, you have my attention, you have everybody else's attention right here. We have a lot of great comments coming in. Keep sending them in, by the way. We have Fred for like 30 minutes, which is like hardest amount of time to get. So let's use it. But uh, what are the three objections you have to deal with most and then talk about how you overcome them? I, I think the biggest objection we still have is is sort of the, the, the communications piece. It's people confuse far UVC or 222 nanometer with UVC, which we've been told for a long time has danger associated with it. Um, I would even state that some of that danger is probably already overstated o over the years. Uh, we have utilized it successfully in certain places. Uh, upper air uh, type uh, sanitization has been utilizing UVC for years and successfully. It's been proven to disrupt pathogens. So we, we, we know... Uh, intrinsically, it works, but we've been told from day one it causes us harm. I mean, the the, the entire sunscreen uh, idea of going to the beach putting sunscreen on to stay away from the UV. By the way, that isn't actually UVC. That's UVA and UVB we're concerned with there. But we still have this idea, this mental image that UVC is going to be harmful. And specifically, we cannot yet differentiate. So telling that story is definitely number one. Okay. Number two is number two is people are, aren't sure how to use it yet. People aren't really sure if there's going to be a prescription from it. Is this is this something that's going to be regulated in some way that they don't know yet? Is it something that's that isn't they're not familiar with? But the fact is, it is already regulated. There there is guidance through through NIOSH, and, and that says how much we're allowed to expose ourselves to this wave of plant, even though at that point we thought it was harmful. When we when we put that guidance in place, now we still we can still put these lights in below that threshold, and have a light that is not harmful and, and and understand how it works. So I think understanding how we get into those various nooks and crannies of, of, of business and, 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 of, and of regulation um, is gonna be very important to go by. And then the last thing is, is purely this idea that it, it's gonna to be too expensive or because it's so new and, and that it doesn't have to be that. Yeah, this, as you look at all the other things you're gonna consider doing in, in terms of treating your environment, uh, this is not terribly expensive. This can be very approachable by businesses, by, by transit, uh, with, without huge price tags associated with it. it, it it's not uh, an insurmountable problem. It's just a way of telling the story in a way that's understood. So before we open up the questions and keep them coming, can you, uh, and not to speak for himself, and we'll invite everybody to, we'll post some links at the end of this chat so you can do your own research. And I, and I encourage everybody, do your research, tear it apart, right? Like we need to have an open dialogue. But uh, can you summarize a little bit of the safety research that has happened at Columbia University, Dr. Brenner, and also out of Kyoto and also out of Scotland, just to give a sense of what's been tested and demonstrated? There have been uh, about a decade of published studies that have been peer reviewed and third party reviewed and published in major journals, uh, both by Dr. Brenner, by folks at Kobe University, uh, by folks in, in, at Seoul National University, uh, and, and throughout the world. And it continues there uh, and, and it will continue. Like, we still still study, still study UVC, uh, and we've had it for 80 years. We'll still study far UVC as well, and we'll continue to have more and more studies. But but these studies indicate that this type of light will not penetrate the dead layer of, of skin or will not penetrate our eyes and does not affect the human body in any way. And if you think about it, when you look at the size of a, of a virus, uh, a submicron size, you look at the size of a skin cell or, or a layer that's 25, 30 times that, um, you understand this, if this could only penetrate uh, a micron or less, it just can never get to anything in our body that's going to cause harm to us. Well, interesting thing, Dr. Branner got passionate about uh, this research, not because of coronavirus per se, but because of necessarily influenza and uh, the resistance that we were developing these superbugs because we're so loaded up on antibiotics from the time we're little kids. That's what got him passionate. So I've read a lot about uh, potentially another strain of swine flu coming uh, forth and it's gonna be a particularly strong influenza season, right? There, I think the only type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, is basically mold spores, right? That are basically too large to be penetrated by 222. But can you talk about the range of conditions you think this would be helpful if this was pervasive in indoor environments? Well, I, th I think 
if this becomes pervasive, first of all, we will create resilience in that environment um, because we will be able to utilize it at times where people get sick, whether it's the common cold, whether it's a virus, whether it's a bacteria, it, it, will, it will be rather effective against all those. There may be some molds we have, we have to test further to see what the effect of this is. We, we don't know yet, yet some of that, but we'll continue to do that research. Um, so I, I think it, it really will sort of get after pretty much most of the pathogens we're concerned about today. Okay. All right, good. Let's ask some uh, questions while we while we still have you. Heather, you can throw them up too, or I can throw some up. Um, okay. Fred, I don't know if you can see these, but I'll throw them off. Is there a risk of taking these away? We have adapted. To, oh, this is interesting. I've asked you this question. Let me summarize this, right? We have a sort of a, you know, biome on our skin and whatnot. Is there a risk of taking that away by virtue of, you know, far UV light and basically sanitizing everything around you? Well, first of all, we're not, we're not suggesting today that you want to put it onto your skin. We're not suggesting today you want to put it in areas where it's going to have that much of a deleterious damage. We're really mostly concerned to start with in, in the air around us, and what we're trying to remove from the air around us is, is this particular pathogen at the moment or right. others that, that, are, that are like it. So um, I, I think over a period of time, you're, you're not looking to deactivate an entire biome on your skin with this. this is not, that's not the intended use for it. Okay. Let's keep going. What do we got? Can this be used safely in schools or in between classes to clean them? And maybe here is a good another opportunity to reiterate how much far UV is already being used in vacant spaces, in buses and other hospital environments versus the vision for for this. Yeah, so the, the short answer is, is yes. Um, it could be used between classes, certainly clean. It could be used during classes if that was so chosen. But there's also places we could put it within within a school or classroom where it's just cleaning the air and, and never directly emitting on, onto us if we, if we wanted to be careful about the children in some way or there was some concern specifically about, about that. So it can be used simultaneously with people in class or it can be used separately uh, without them in class. Yeah, interesting. For those who really want to go down the rabbit hole on the science, there are some studies that, Fred, I think they're from the 30s or 40s around tuberculosis and around using a UV up light, right, to clean the air and how they achieved, I'm probably going to get this wrong, a 30% reduction or something in a, uh, compared to a classroom that didn't have it. It, oh. it, ran, it ran all the way through the 60s, I think, is when they stopped those studies. Um, and it looked at it looked at TB. It also I think it looked at mumps and, uh, and a few other things at the time. Uh, I, I think the best result was, was almost 70%. But I think 30% okay. is what we started. And to be clear, that's up light. This is down light. So, Fred, let's, so let's paint a picture. We're in a restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to go back to, you know, mingling again, right? We don't want to have to deal with social distancing in perpetuity. Um, you're in an indoor space in a, in a restaurant. Can you paint a picture of where the lights would be, how far they would be from you? Would they even be lights? Because they don't have to be lights. They could be invisible. Just make it a little less abstract. Yeah, so so they they could be invisible. They could be shining directly on on a tabletop while while you're while you're there. You wouldn't see they were on, but they'd be on. But if you have distances, say between one and two meters, three to six feet uh, from where the light source is, you'll you'll get a very very effective cleaning of that surfaces while you're eating and while you're using the uh, facility. Right. Okay. Helpful. Here's another uh, safety question. I think it's good to keep going back. If I'm being re redundant, everybody, it's on purpose, right? Because I think in fairness, there's so much clutter out there. There's UV wands. There's a lot of what seems a little bit far-fetched, lots of claims. I just want to keep drilling down uh, to this question. Yeah, so, so um, this question is one we come up with quite often, and, and that is, you know, NIOSH, um, uh, through, which is sort of administrated through OSHA, um, actually looked at this uh, exact question. They looked at it in terms of occupational safety, if you were under it, eight hours a day through an entire work week uh, and, and continuously. Um, and when they thought it was harmful, we're still below the thresholds of the levels they set for that. And all the evidence we have says it's it's not harmful. So um, I, I don't believe so, certainly, that there, there would be a long harm, any, any harm over a long period. Um, I'm, I'm under it regularly. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about power usage. Just uh, for anyone out there who owns a business and as a contractor or anything wants to understand the power load, can you explain? Sure. So um, there, there are different types of emitters that are associated with far UVC. Uh, an emitter that's something like a downlight, uh, which would be over a, either a pendant or a sconce or a ceiling, um, those are going to consume about an extra 15 watts when when they're on at full power. Okay. Here's so another. pretty trivial compared to the service it's, it's giving you. So we're trying, now we're talking about downlight, right? Which is air and surface. Let's talk about uh, cleaning the air through UV, which takes different manifestations. Why don't you talk about yours? So, so in, in a number of uh, ventilation systems, these are already utilized. Uh, UVC, UVC has already been utilized. Far UVC can be utilized, um, but there, there are issues there. And, and the issues are we have to make sure that the air is exposed uh, to the, the, the light long enough to deactivate the pathogen. 
And when you get to these very, very large air moving systems, uh, you just don't have enough time or you have to add so much energy into it in that spot that it's not as effective as you'd like it to be. It, it's, it's better at a smaller point where you can control sort of how much airflow is passing by that in real time uh, to make sure you get that, that, that pathogen deactivation rate you're looking for. Here's another good, interesting logistical question. Would you need to reconstruct the way the lights are installed or they fit in standard fixtures? Look. So I, I held it up before, I'll, I'll hold it up again. Yep. This, this fits into a standard uh, downlight fixture or will fit into a standard pendant fixture. It screws into the same base and, and, and just slides in. So um, I, I don't think it needs to be refit in any way. Uh, they're made to design and designed to fit in standard fixtures. And we also supply them with standard fixtures like downlights and pendants and, and wall sconces. So here's a question. I, I've never seen this one before. What do you think? Is, is sunblock actually going to block it if you were in an indoor space? You know, although I know that's not the objective is your skin anyway, obviously. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. I am not sure I have data on that. I don't either. I, I'm happy to, to look into it and, and see if we can find some information. Let's 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 get back to that one. OK, uh, let's see if there's any other ones. Uh, I think we covered this one. So, Fred, big picture, right? If you had to make, I know you've been so passionate about this, evangelizing not just about this light, but generally the power of light mm -hmm. to restore life in other ways or to improve the quality of life through circadian light. Just you've devoted your whole life to this. But if you could wave a wand right now in a pandemic, just you're in charge, Fred, of, of science and the United States of America. What do you want to happen? I, I really want to use every tool we have to create environments that are safer for us to occupy, environments that are safer for us to come, come home from, and environments that can reduce the spread of this, this and any other pathogen we, we may be confronted by. And I would take all stops out and, and find a way to make this country the leader in, in pushing that technology into this market and every other market around the world. And where do you think is the number one use case that you think right away? Where would you start? If you had to sequence it, who are you trying to overcome the first? Transit systems? Where, where are you putting your energy? I, I, mean, I mean, some of the first ones, I think only because of, of the danger to them, will, will be within senior living, uh, places where we have to occupy space and, and, and people don't have a choice but to be there. Um, I, I think ultimately some, some hospitals will, will make use of it. Yeah, my, dad, my, dad is, uh, my dad is in a senior uh, senior home and he got, he had COVID. Uh, he's been through every cancer he's had. He had COVID. And, no, we can't visit him. The day when New York shut down, I was visiting a bunch of students who were in a GD program in New York, and uh, Heather was with me, and I was supposed to go see my dad, and that was the day they shut him down, and I've never seen him again. But he's now locked in effectively a prison, you know, where he can't see anybody. He survived COVID, and even though he survived, I still can't see him. So my, I think that if anything, if you could get people to start paying attention so we could roll it out, you know, it's, to some extent, I feel like people have been discarded, right? Like that, okay, well, they're they're older. Like, we're all going to be in the same position one day, and we want people to advocate for us, too. Uh, and my dad is in that position. Yeah, my, my parents are down in South Florida, and they're they're also aging. And, um, you know, I, haven't, I or my uh, my children haven't been able to see them in three months now. Um, so it, it's, it, it, it's terrible when you think about what this has done to us as a society. Uh, a, a lot of that, that connectedness that we take for granted. A lot of simply being able to go see parents, being able to see children, grandchildren, has been taken away from us by how we have to react to this. So if, if in some small way we, we can interrupt that so that we can bring out a, a normal where we can reduce the possibility of this contagion spreading, reduce the possibility of our environment becoming contaminated, uh, I, I think that does good in, in so many ways. Um, but the other, the other area is, is obviously within transit. If we don't solve uh, for transit, um, we're not going to get back to transit. No, no one's going to feel comfortable to get into a subway car. No one's going to feel comfortable to get into an Uber unless we figure out a way to, to sort of communicate to them that, that has been cleaned or that has been continuously being cleaned. Let's talk about some of the, uh, the you right, right. Let's talk about some of the use cases that we used to take for granted and now that we crave, right? We go to the ATM machine. We touch what now we're very aware. Those are very dirty keys. And then you touch your eye, your face, you know, you, you go into that Uber. Now we're all, you know, nervous about doing that. Mm -hmm. Go to the supermarket and go to the checkout, touch the screen. Can you talk a little bit? Are you tackling those or how are you tackling those? We are. We're, we're tackling with a, a whole host of technologies. We're tackling it with, with the UVCs that have occupancy and motion sensors so that you can get a very near field cleaning so a, a keypad can be cleaned in, in, literally in, in seconds, possibly. Um, a checkout counters of, of uh, supermarkets. You know, between belts and between touch pads, between cashiers, there are so many touch points that are being touched over and over and over again. Um, and even if someone wears a mask, it doesn't necessarily prevent it from uh, from being touched and brought back home somehow. Right. Um, so I, I think th those are areas we, we continue to tackle. We have novel solutions for that. We have novel solutions for uh, ATMs. Um, and we'll continue to introduce more and more product in that space uh, 
Retail banking is another area that really people don't want to get back into the branches or into the ATMs, and they're going to need some additional level of, of protection associated with that. And so you have a whole legion of people who are watching you right now and will be watching this uh, on replay. Uh, everyone feels somewhat powerless and probably frustrated that science has been politicized. I know I have. And as a result, it's so hard to, for to figure out you know, what's real, what's not. I feel like science to some extent has also let us down. It's just not the political system, right? When there was resistance from the CDC at first to have masks, now we wear masks, you know, but whatever, we move on. You know, what can the legions of people who are interested in this do? What it like? Read, understand, listen, and participate. Um, we, we have to become smart ourselves because we can't trust the news we're getting from all sorts of areas today. So re read the fundamental data. It, it is approachable. It's, it's not so technical that, that it can't be understood. Uh, listen to folks like Dr. Brenner and the other scientists who've been studying this for a decade who have got no, no horse in, in the race, right? They, they just want the science to get out and, and to be understood and, and, and come to a conclusion yourself. Uh, at, at the end of the day, we think it is very, very solid. This is a safe technology. This is a wonderful tool to go out and combat things like COVID and other things that we will see in the future. And this is a great way we can get back to our stores, our banks, our transit, uh, without having to have the fear that this is brought to us. Well, Fred, I know you have, I said I would let you do 30 minutes. And uh, I just want to, I just want to say, uh, I have watched how hard you've been working, how hard you've been dealing. Like, you know, you have decided to not quarantine yourself. I mean, I know you, I don't know how you're doing. You're running all over because you need to take these meetings and you need to meet with municipalities. I know you were in New York having some pretty groundbreaking meetings over the last couple of days. And I have spent a ton of time and energy. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert, but I educated myself and I'm putting my reputation and my credibility to the extent to which it matters behind this because I believe in what you're doing. And I sometimes believe in life, you need to take matters into your own hands. This is not a situation we're gonna wait for the cavalry to arrive, whatever it is, whether it's UV light or it's masks or it's the politicization of your science or it's getting active in the political process in the election, do something. This is the something that I have chosen to do, but you have been doing it on the front line trying to convince people. I know we're gonna look back in 10 years and sort of laugh. Like, do you remember when it was so hard to explain to everybody, but it's those people like you are on the bleeding edge who are pulling us all forward that eventually we're gonna, you know, big debt of gratitude. So I'm gonna leave you with the final word or anything you want to say, anything that excites you, anything you want to tell me. You, you, you've kind of come to the final word already. And the final word is science should not be political. It doesn't need to be political. There, there's no reason it should be political. Stick with where the science is taking us and, and we can find solutions. And, and this is one of those solutions we have found. And, I, and I'd like it to be something we find as, as an entire civilization if it's possible, but uh, this will help. And this is one of the greatest tools we have today to deal with these types of pandemics, as well as the other diseases we talked about and the ones that uh, Dr. Brenner were interested in originally. Right. Um, this is this is one of those solutions. All right. Well, stay safe because we need you. So, you know, be careful. <laughs> Keep wearing your mask. Try to limit your travel. And uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. A little dense. Uh, Heather on my team will put lots of links in of any of the side of studies. Any skeptical question you have, please fire away. We want to hear every type of objection because it's in our collective interest that Fred's right. Right. Like I have obviously I backed this company. I believe in it, but I'm backing humanity. So if it's if it's wrong in any way, we want to expose it. I don't believe it is. But if you have a question that we feel like we haven't addressed, you know, please ask it here and I'll be back next week with another edition. All right. Safe travels, Fred. Thank you, Matt. Take care.